Opa sagits, maz girat, sagitio sagits, meets girish wakish. My name is Dr. Royce K. Young Wolf. Um, I am so honored to be here tonight to share in another evening of song and poetry and lots of knowledge and experiencing experiences spanning um, really before 2016. So before that, though, I want to uh, shift up the usual land acknowledgement and bring in some other people who um, have also helped me learn and understand what this place is and where we are. The video and the audio that you hear is from our coastline just down the road, um, the Long Island Sound. These were the, what I am sharing with you is information that was written by Jennifer Rawlings. Um, who is part of the indigenous leaders here at Yale. She is also a descendant and member of the people who have taken care of and steward this land um, for over 10,000 years. So she's written, here at Yale, in New Haven, we are standing on the lands of the Quinnipiac people. Like other native groups, the Quinnipiac draw their name from their homeland's landscape. Quinnipiac means long water people in the Algonquin language. The long waters refer to the Quinnipiac River. The name of this state of Connecticut is also a derivation of the same name. I'd like to add that expanding on this, the land has been drastically altered since contact and the establishment of New Haven and Yale University. The coastline, waterways, and relationships with the land and people have shifted over time. Yet each of these places represent the memories and interconnected histories of the indigenous people who have stewarded these lands and waterways for over 10,000 years. The Quinnipiac, the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scattercook, Golden Hill Pagusset, Niantic, Muncie Lenape, and other Algonquin peoples. This land also has been traveled by regional people of the Dawn Land, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, as well as distant relatives from across Turtle Island or North America. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Jennifer is amongst a wonderful group of indigenous people that work here at Yale. They live in the surrounding areas and they commit um, and integrate meaningful bits of their indigenous knowledge. Um, and it's always wonderful for us to be able to integrate our community and remember that it's not just people in positions like me overseeing the Native American and North American collections. We have many people amongst us who help continue to keep this work going. Jennifer and those of us working to bring greater awareness of these relationships and long history ask that you leave this space and return to your respective workplaces and communities. You carry with you this affirmative pledge to not only acknowledge, but to make space and amplify the indigenous perspectives and voices that are vital to our collective community. Tonight, again, it's my honor to continue to share this platform and this stage with, um, with students and colleagues and mentors, um, relatives who continue to inspire me and who have been building the foundation of this work before I was even here. Tonight I have with me Kay McClearly, who is Little Shell Ojibwe. They grew up on the Crow Reservation in Montana. Kay is a Juris Doctorate candidate at the Yale Law School. They co-curated the exhibition, Place, Nations, Generations, Beings, at the Yale University Art Gallery. And in 2018, they graduated Yale College with a BA in History. I also have Leah Tamar Shristinian, who is the Program Manager of the NYU Yale American Indian Sovereignty Project. She co-curated the exhibition as well, alongside Leah, um, <laughs> alongside herself, <laughs> alongside Kay. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, and the extended title of that was 200 Years of Indigenous North American Art at the Yale University Art Gallery. In 2019, she graduated Yale College with a BA in Ethnicity, Race, and Migration. I'll be joined in a performance um, with one of my past students who is now a colleague of mine, McKenna Keller, who is currently an MMA student at the Yale School of Music, studying with Professor Stephen Taylor. 
She recently received her MM from Yale in 2020. She received her BM in music performance at the University of Michigan, where she studied with, Nan with Dr. Nancy Ambrose King. In conjunction with Oboe, she completed a minor in history of art, working with arts organizations like the Yale University Art Gallery as a Wordle Gallery teacher and the Detroit Civic Youth Ensemble as a mentor. McKenna works to synthesize her passion for visual and musical art. In the, the flyer and information about this program, I also wanted to feature one of my past students and um, relatives actually distant through my Labukane family. Uh, Zoe Siri is a visual artist born and raised on Treaty 6 territory of central Alberta where her work talk her works talk with her culture that raised her Cookham's lineage of Beaver Lake Cree Nation and Mosham's Métis lineage. These conversations oscillate between the terrains of paint, beads, and textiles, focusing on place and enlivening material. Oops. I'll get that set back up. These conversations oscillate between the terrains of paint, beads, and textiles, focusing on place and enlivening material associations. Here, relations speak about language and memory, where it can be found and what it says when it reaches. Siri completed a Bachelor of Visual Arts with a minor in Curatorial Studies from Emily Carr University. Siri is now at Yale University <coughs> working on her MFA in painting and printmaking. All of you have received an envelope. In that envelope, you will find a cyanotype. The images on those cyanotypes, and some of them are very, very light. Some of them didn't develop fully. Those were all transferred from drawings that were created during my workshops on the complexities of representation for indigenous people here at Yale. They were made by Central Museum assistants, they were made by mount makers, by other collection managers, as well as curators and team members here um, across Yale. While we go through this, you're welcome to hold those materials, to feel them, to feel the textures, to look at the designs. This is how memories are made. This is how tactile experiences get infused in material culture. I would like you to continue to bring that piece with you. That's my gift to you and also from the people who participated in the workshops. And I hope that that piece, that cyanotype will continue to remind you of the knowledge that we are still all seeking. This is very much a journey. This is a process. This whole institution is in a place of transition to better represent indigenous people, the artwork that they create, and also the collections that we are stewarding here. <coughs> the structure of this presentation, we will go through the performance. Um, I'm going to grab a drink of water real quick to clear my throat. Um, I'll be joined by McKenna Keller, who is doing her interpretation of Jacqueline Wilson from the series for Zakala Sa in 2019 by Raven Chacon. Added into that, you will hear in the background the sounds <clears throat> of a heartbeat. You will also hear the um, growls of buffalo back home from where I'm from. Um, I will have original vocables and spoken word integrated with, with um, McKenna's wonderful score that I am so thankful and amazed for. Um, all right. After that, we will go into a conversation with Kay and Leah. I'll wrap up with some Where Are We Now facts. Um, and what we look to be doing in the future. And then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um, we started a couple minutes late, so we're probably gonna go just a little bit over, um, but we'll try to wrap up and not keep you all too late. Okay. Could you turn this mic off, please?
Um, lots of hearts. Thank you. Try not to make eye contact. <laughs> to cry. <laughs> um, oh, this work has um, taken us all places that I don't think we even thought about when we started this type of work. And the work that we do specifically is to access ancestral collections, to access indigenous works of art, research them, try to make sense of them, find the meanings inside them, and try to elicit those stories that are kept within the fibers. Not all of that is successful. Um, some of it challenges us in ways that we're still trying to overcome. Um, but I wanted to thank you both again. You've been doing this work beginning in 2016. You began the development of the place nations, generations, beings, over 200 years of indigenous North American art. In that exhibition, there was over 75 works of art and cultural materials from the early 19th century to the present, put on view here at the Yale University Art Gallery. Um, to my knowledge, the first large exhibition of its kind representing indigenous people of this area. And it was from all over North America. I have so many questions, <laughs> <laughs> but I know we only have a little bit of time. Some of the things that you've talked about and we've shared about is these processes almost inherently become 
a process of extraction is we're trying to figure out how do we compensate people for their knowledge? How do we bring them in to do informational sessions and consultation? Um, and we don't always think about what is the amount of time it takes to actually think on those requests. And then what are we engaging? What is the space we're coming into? And do we really know how we're going to leave afterwards? What residues are gonna be left on us? So I'd like to hear your thoughts on this process. What type of extraction you experienced while researching and then being asked to participate in a process of extraction? And how has that shifted your practice and shifted the knowledge that you have now today? Yeah, so I can, I can start off. And I think, um, so we started the project of curating place nations generations beings in 2016 and at the time we were juniors in college and um, hadn't not obviously had a lot of experience curating at that <laughs> point um, and so I think came into the Yale art gallery structure and also the Peabody structure as well um, sort of not with a lot of knowledge of maybe how we could have shaped it as our own um, and so we kind of just went with the structure that was there and I think for so long um, Yale as an institution has had an extractive relationship with Native people mm -hmm. um, historically and um, that was sort of the structure that we came into and so I think we came in with a lot of good intentions of building positive relationships with Native communities and Native artists throughout the process of curating the exhibit, while also working within maybe a structure that I think now looking back and reflecting maybe was a bit outdated and it was sort of in line with these historical um, relationships that Yale's had with indigenous communities. And um, that meant basically that, you know, when we were going to artists and communities, we didn't have a ton to offer them. Um, they were giving us a lot of knowledge um, about the uh, art and, and ancestors that we were, you know, including the exhibit, but um, we didn't have much to offer in return for that. And so I think now is sort of like looking back or trying to think about how to maybe not um, have that type of extractive relationship. I think thinking of ways to, <clears throat> coming from like a place of like an institution that has more power and resources, how to offer that to communities and artists when you're coming to them and asking them for things. And also thinking about how those communities and artists might want to have a relationship with you as an institution, um, which was just not something that we were really, I think really critically thinking about at that point yet. Hmm. Now what was that experience for you? And I think, you know, good intentions, good intentions are always involved in this type of work. Mm -hmm. But when you combine those, the extraction, but you still have good intentions. Yeah, I think we, I'm, I'm very proud of our work and the, all of the folks who collaborated and all the students who helped us um, to curate the exhibition. And, um, but looking back, I do think, you know, we, like I personally, and I also think the Yale as an institution gained a lot more from the exhibit than any native communities or native artists who are not connected to Yale. Um, and so I think that when I think about good intentions, like, like Kay was saying, we were two students with our um, co-curator Joseph and we had the best of intentions and we were working with um, a lot of people who had really good intentions and wanted to increase the amount of representation of native art at Yale. Um, and improve it, but folks with good intentions that are slotted into a system or are working within a system that has 200 years of extractive practices behind it um, can only do so much because that's looking at you know our own individual you know intentions and, and agency. But we really need is like a shift 
um, a broader shift within an institution about uh, goals and understandings of how to relate to these materials and how to take part in restorative and reparative practices. Because I think even if you know we tried to you know give back to folks who gave us knowledge, we but we only have had so much to give, like a list of items at the Peabody from their community or a copy of the catalog. Um, and that sort of only scratches, doesn't even really scratch the surface of what mm. needs to be restored. Um, and then even given on top of that restoration to make up for the type of extractive like loss that having these materials here represents. Yeah. Um, so I think we kind of get to a place where we can't, we can't rely on people's good intentions because the work, when you're working in an institution like this, it's, we have to be coming from a place where our, inst our intentions don't matter to us. Like that's not the point. Yeah. Um, and the, they can't be central in the, the process of creating change. Yeah, the process is, is so unique doing this type of work. And here at Yale, this, the situation for Native American artwork, Native American and indigenous cultural material is also very unique, but it is a structure that is known across the globe. At Yale University, we have multiple collection institutions. And in this exhibit, you were drawing upon collections and getting feedback and working with artists that were from the Yale University Art Gallery. They were from the Yale University, or the Yale Peabody Museum. They were also from the Beinecke. Mm -hmm. And each one of these individual institutions have their own structures. They have their own procedures and guidelines for actually how informational sessions are managed and then how that knowledge is documented. Also how people are compensated and taken care of. Um, and that is certainly something that has been part of my work researching and trying to figure out where we are and what has been done, what has happened. Um, and I've learned so much from what you both have been able to build bridges between those collections, the support that you got from the gallery and professors and curators to kind of help foster those relationships. Um, and me coming into the space as a postdoc in the history of art and the Yale University Art Gallery, I did find there was only glimpses of your experience. There was only glimpses of the people you worked with and people who were brought in to advise. And that's one of the structures, thinking about what is the value of knowledge mm. and what should actually be kept in the archive um, and object files. Um, those are things that we continue to work on today. Okay, I'd like to um, kind of ask you a little bit more about the personal experience of being in these spaces and interacting with the materials that are here because the university stewards some of the most robust and marvelous as well as um, stories of trauma and genocide and colonization. Those are all intermixed in the collections here. Did you feel that you were prepped for that experience? Was those spaces welcoming to you? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I'm thinking back to sort of the beginnings of this, the curatorial project and engagement with, in particular, the Peabody Gallery. And um, I remember coming in as like a first year in college and visiting both spaces. And at the time, I think the gallery maybe had a couple of pieces on view in the decorative arts um, exhibit. And then the Peabody had an old exhibit, which is now no longer there. And I remember feeling as somebody who had come from um, an indigenous community and was used to seeing native art all around. My mom is also an, a native artist. 
um, I was just like, this seems so odd. And I wasn't really like mentally, I think, prepared or emotionally mm -hmm. to encounter our art uh, presented in the ways that they were at both institutions. And that's really kind of what pushed me to get involved in this, the project, um, and in many other Native students as well, because I think many Native students at Yale have had the same experiences in these spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, then when it came to curating and being in the collection spaces, yeah, I really wasn't prepared at all for uh, what that would be like in terms of being around um, materials that at the time, it was a different collection space than it is, I think, now. It was, a, uh, everything was at the Peabody and it was in, you know, wooden drawers and there wasn't a lot of organization. Well, there was organization, but it, it was just like, you didn't know what you were gonna open if you opened a drawer, mm. um, which is a, uh, for indigenous people, there are sometimes, you know, art and, and objects that we might not wanna be around for different reasons. And so that was a bit alarming to me. Um, and I hadn't, because I was young and hadn't been in those spaces before with family members necessarily, uh, I didn't really know how to be in those types of spaces. So it was kind of like through the process of curating, also learning how to be an indigenous person in collection spaces and trying to figure out what I should be asking for, um, and how we might want to have inter be interacting with the art. Uh, mm -hmm. as well. <coughs> yeah, thank you. What were your kind of experiences? You have a different background than Kay. Um, you're also, but you, you know the same type of work and research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not indigenous um, to North America and I think my experience was very different. Like the ways we were called into the work were very different and it makes me think of how sort of unfair um, or how, how very um, divided like student experiences are based on your positionality. Because I came into the work um, largely through my experiences with the art gallery and being a gallery guide. Um, and I was drawn into the space by admiration for a lot of the works that I saw there. And then, of course, through being a gallery guide, I got very familiar with the collections and um, noticed a lot of gaps and areas where I felt representation was it was lacking. Um, and so that is sort of how I uh, became part of the internship um, focusing on Native art that turned into our exhibition. But I feel like it was a real privilege for me to have come into a space of art because I felt called into it rather than mm -hmm. feeling called to join in and to have a relationship with these spaces because you felt like you were one of the only people who could like speak against what was happening there, you know? Um, and I feel like that is a really harsh way to start a relationship with a place and an institution where you kind of go in already thinking like, I have to be in this space to do battle. Um, and I just think that's very unfair and is, is an experience that a lot of Native students have and a lot of students of color have in a lot of spaces across Yale. Um, but I think, yeah, so. Yeah, it's interesting, because I think that <coughs> is the case, particularly with Native students as well. We During the course of curating the exhibit, we had a Native Student Advisory Board, um, which was kind of our attempts to try to like have more Native students involved and have more mm -hmm. voices. And they also wrote some of the labels, which was really exciting, and some of the the um, the language in the publication that accompanied the exhibit. And they similarly, I think, felt the same way that I was, and that they felt compelled to do the work. They felt compelled to give their time to this advisory board. Uh, because they felt like they weren't being represented well in these spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, it is a very different orientation. And I feel like thinking about moving forward, like there's so much repair that has to happen with that too. You know, there's repair that has to happen with why these, why this art is here. And then there's repair that has to happen with the people that are continuing to interact with these institutions. Because it's like, because there is all of that history mm -hmm. um, that is being inherited here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, you know, I, I did quite a bit of work just talking with people when I came here. It really felt like I knew so little and in the literature online, there was so little information that provided a comprehensive view of what this place is. A status report about what the relationships are with the indigenous people. Is there an indigenous liaison at the presidential level or provost level? What is happening within each of the different collection institutions? And so I spent almost my first year here in the postdoc really just talking and trying to learn and trying to figure out why is this place the way it is. And like in my song and my collaboration with McKenna, where is the heart? That is constantly what I am looking for in this work. But when you come in as an indigenous person, it is very hard to have your heart outward. Mm -hmm. to let that be exposed because you don't know quite what's the environment in these spaces. Um, <clears throat> thank you both for sharing your insight into this. What are your thoughts and feelings on coming back into this space, into this gallery and being, actually, I don't know if I've asked you, have you revisited any of the collections? since your time. No, actually ha we haven't. Uh, yeah, neither of us have visited collections, um, but would love to. Something we talked about actually at the end of the exhibit was that um, we were going to like miss spending time with the, with the art because we had spent so much time in collections um, with them and yeah, it would be, be nice to, to go back and visit. But I think in general to your, you know, your first question of what is it like to be back in this space, it feels very different in a lot of ways. I think mm -hmm. part of that is that, like speaking for myself, I'm older. Um, I've had more experience, particularly in institutions where there aren't a lot of native people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in, for, because of that experience, I feel more comfortable. But also, I mean, I think having you here and it's mm -hmm. been a complete shift in, in how I have felt personally in the gallery space um, and I think just in general, having more native people involved in the gallery and the Peabody will do so much to make the space feel more, um, more welcoming. And yeah, I just, I, it is, it feels better. And I think it's partially because of now of the people, um, who are now here. Yeah. How do you feel? about the spaces yeah um i feel uh, somewhat similarly i feel like it, it the spaces feel differently in terms of mm, it's very dependent i think um on whether you're there or not mm -hmm. uh i don't go to the art gallery very often the peabody of course has been closed i think the process of curating the exhibit was incredible and transformative in many ways, but there was also a lot of battles and sometimes we say parts of it felt like we were like pulling teeth sometimes. Mm. And I think there was a lot of hurt um, from my time curating, but also my time as a gallery guide for various different reasons. Um, and I think the spaces don't always feel the most welcoming to me, but when you invite me, to come in and be there for certain moments. Um, like you've brought in these new Marie Watt pieces. I think it's a, the Forest series mm -hmm. with the jingles. Um, and you invited us to come before the gallery opened and, and activate the pieces with you um, and be there with a group of folks who really kind of understood the meaning of those pieces and how um, like the sound would like resonate through the space. And I, I think that is one of the best, like that is a moment where I have felt the best in the art mm. gallery. Um, and it's something that I think about a lot. Um, even these events, I think the way that you set up the space and 
incorporate song and incorporate emotion and um, talk about the collections as being ancestral collections, not as being, you know, Yale's collections in a way, like sets these spaces up to feel a lot better and to heal some of the things that maybe um, are lingering. Mm. But I also know that you've talked a lot about how it, it, Yale's relationship with Native people can't be dependent on personality mm-hmm. and can't be dependent on whether or not you're there. Um, so while the changes, the spaces feel different because there, there are, there's more indigenous art on display and you bring um, a way of interacting with it that feels really good. But I also think that they can feel the same depending on you know who, who you're in the space with. And so I don't think yet the spaces themselves are like emanating a sense of like belonging or like my wanting to like actively seek them out um, unless we curate a community together to, to go into them, you know, yes. as a group. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, these type of expressions are, they're never easy and they're not hard, they're not easy to hear either. Um, some of the, the main key points from this work that we're doing that has been set out and handed to us to do, it very much fell upon your shoulders and your shoulders and the people you were collaborating with and Joseph's shoulders to try and create a process of displaying art that would speak back to and push back to all of the missteps in the past, that it would speak back to the wants and needs of, of this institution and the people who come into it. Part of the work that I try to understand is just, just the space. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that we're doing right now is to just assess and understand what the spaces are. What can we do to make them more welcoming? And how can we highlight and go and work with artists and collaborate like with modern and contemporary art, um, Keely um, and Margaret who are here. <coughs> they were so influential and supportive in working on the acquisition of the new Marie Watt yeah. works. They've also worked with me to bring in another work by Teresa Baker who will be, um, I d- actually don't have a photo of it, of either of them, but those will be in the galleries um, in the future. Each of those artists are extremely intentional about the spaces that their work exists in, the spaces that they build relationships with viewers. And the dynamic spaces here at the university are not in tandem. They don't, they're not seeking the same approach. And that is um, something that we're all trying to understand is how do we create a comprehensive space that when you say for an indigenous person, you can go into the gallery, you can go into the Beinecke, you can go into the Peabody and it is a safe space. And you know immediately when you go in there, what is actually in that space? (coughs) Where can you go where there's not burial or funerary materials on display, which often with the intermixing of the cultural materials, it is respectful for some cultures outside of Native North America to have those type of works on display. But there should be transparency about how we inform the public and in what ways that sh- is best done, so it's not offensive. Um, and then how do we honor the host culture, the people here in this place, what they, their cultural specific um, requests, shift up this space a little bit more than say something out west or on the California coast or in Canada or with the First Nations building those relationships with the host community. And I've been able to do um, a couple uh, events where we have been able to hear those experiences. Um, But there is so much work wrapped up into just that question, where is the heart and what is this space? Some of the things that we're trying to do and understand how we can actually modify techniques that 
are in place at indigenous institutions. But here at Yale, this is not an indigenous institution, so we can't just take a model and copy and paste it here. We have to modify it and be very strategic about it. Culturally responsive care is like wall-to-wall -wall insurance. From the point a person enters a room, <laughs> from the way they travel across this space, from the way they interact with the different spaces, culturally responsive care can be integrated into all of it. And it can be as simple as where is the heart of the artist and what were their intentions with the engagement of their works? Where is the heart of the curators? And what are their intentions in the way that they are representing that work and in the spaces that they have them in? What are in the adjacent spaces? And then that transfers over to even, you know, communicating with artists or knowledge keepers of ancestral materials. Where is the heart in that? What is the greatest and most important message that they want to convey generations down the line? So we have ancestral works here from over 10,000 years ago in the archeological collection. And it's hard to hear those voices and those messages and those materials, but they're there. We just need to actually put a structured way to elicit those voices and those meanings. And we talk to the most closely related groups. Um, and all of this collection stewardship eventually should be part of a collection management plan. And we create comprehensive facility reports. We can create a comprehensive facility report that is also inclusive of the cultural responsive care and the knowledge about what is in the spaces. Environmentals, those studies should also include culturally what is in that space and how is a person going to be impacted in that space? How are the materials going to be impacted in that space? And there's, there's no single answer to this type of work. With the new Peabody exhibit, we've, we've had to revisit the plans for that exhibit space many times over this course of development and plans to reopen that space. <coughs> And we're not quite there yet. So there will be minimal displays, but you can trust that each one of those displays have been intentional and have included this type of care. All the way to the point where we have an artist who is comfortable in having their work displayed here at the Yale University Art Gallery in these spaces but has requested that their work not be displayed in the Peabody because we're still in a process of transition to make that a good space. Um, and understanding where is transparency. I know not one person here can decide how we are fully transparent. Um, and often as an indigenous person or an ally, you're asked to <clears throat> bring your culture into your work. That's not a requirement of many people, though. I can't ask, ask a museum assistant, what's your culture? How is this going to impact you? Those aren't things we usually ask, but it is almost an immediate feeling when you come into these spaces as an indigenous person. So how better can we craft that experience and research and guidelines and procedures and have them formalized <coughs> where we have that forethought. All of this is happening here at Yale University. How long can it be sustained, though? As one person, I'm, I kind of feel like my braid of sweetgrass there. It's a little tattered. <laughs> it's kind of leaving pieces <laughs> as I walk by. <laughs> um, but I have wonderful areas of support. I also have wonderful people who challenge me and then people who have benefit and purpose, but they just aren't there yet. So like your cyanotypes, I can draw out that plan and that map and make that impression and expose it, but you may walk away with a really simple picture of that. It's really up to you how much you let develop and 
and become part of your practice. So some exciting things are happening with the grand reopening of the Peabody. Very exciting things are happening here at the gallery. New collections and figuring out spaces, where is the best place to display art and have that, that safe space. Um, we also have, uh, at the Peabody is one of the first institutions and there is another one, but I didn't quite get permission yet to announce that, but we will have our very own memory pile a tradition that is a stacked group of rocks that signify memory of a place. It signifies deeds and stories. We will have one of those on the east side of the Peabody Museum when it opens up. Um, it is one of the first pieces that is a physical representation on this land that speaks to the people who have always stewarded it. Um, and I look forward to when we have more news about that. I also look forward to the work that you've done because your stories are part of this place now and the relationships that you have and maybe those that were missed are also part of this place that we can keep learning from. And so that is my request that when you engage institutions like this, you think about the longevity of your own archive, the longevity of your own collection and how you are contributing to that story. I wanted to make sure that we wrap this out though and thank those who have um, brought me through my postdoc because this is the conclusion of all of that work over that year and a half here. Um, my departmental mentors and guides um, that brought me in, Millet Gaifman, Mark Mitchell, also those that continue to um, just guide me and uh, be an ear, Stephanie Wiles, Susan Butts. There are far too many other people who contribute to the work that I do here that I can't name them all. But this program has been sponsored um, in part, shared sponsorship by the Department of History of Art, the Yale University Art Gallery, the Yale Peabody Museum, the Yale Group for the Study of Native America, and the Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund. So I want to open up to the audience now and take a few questions. We'll probably go a little bit over, but that's all right. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions or any remarks, please let's stay positive and keep this good <laughs> conversation going. All right. Anyone? Thank you all three very much. Um, this has been a really wonderful kind of chance to hear you all talk about this. Um, I'm, of course, as you know, have investments in Beinecke and sense of how we can bring Beinecke into these conversations, particularly because if we think about a library and the library systems kind of traditionally has always been a little bit outside of museums, galleries, and so um, my question is sort of twofold in hearing from Kay and Leah what your experience kind of trying to do this cross collection um, endeavor was, and particularly because Beinecke right now and the restructuring of the libraries is really interested in cross collection access, both within theirs but then also kind of thinking broadly. And then Royce, um, you know, how you see Beinecke's role um, and you're already juggling two positions, it seems like, at the Peabody and here, right? I'd love to give you a whole department. <laughs> but how are we going to think about Beinecke within this and, and the work that you see that still needs to be done there? So. Okay. You want to go first? Yeah. Um, our experience at Beinecke was quite different. I think part of it is because it's a library and sometimes we don't always... I don't know, at least I don't always approach libraries in the same way as I do a museum collection. And I think that that is something that we probably should. We should be thinking about them in, in more similar ways because a lot of, there's a lot of incredibly sensitive material at the Beinecke and some of the works that we had the most questions around how can we ethically display these to the public. Those were works in the Beinecke, the, the ledger art, that was done by 
by folks who were actually imprisoned while they were creating art. Um, and so I think these conversations are incredibly important um, to focus on for the Binding Fee collections as well. I think, I, know I don't have too many answers. Um, something that comes to mind immediately is that it would be wonderful to have a sort of a database that we could work with across all of the collections on campus to better understand um, all of the different native and indigenous works um, because we were working with such different databases at all three institutions and that <coughs> definitely created a lot of kind of um, just points of stress in, in our research. Uh, but th mm -hmm. that's what comes to mind immediately. Yeah, there, so I do know there is the Lux program that is being rolled out mm. and there's a lot of work that still is going into it <clears throat> but a thing that complicates it is here at Yale, there is no single term or a group of terms or finding aid that finding aid that will help you explore the Native American and Indigenous collections. Mm -hmm. That's one of the immediate things mm -hmm. that I think um, the Beinecke has. You know, the Library of Congress terms that are implemented there, um, and we're still trying to figure out what are the terms here internally indigenous arts of the Americas is one that we're using as a internal database term. Um, but there are so many that it, it actually is still hard to figure out what's even here. Yeah, I would say um, in a way sometimes for as a student, the Beinecke also feels more accessible in mm -hmm. terms of its collections. I think maybe because by nature it is a library and so it is more maybe bringing in students more or maybe professors are just better at knowing the collections and bringing <laughs> in classes, that could also be the case. But I think that um, in working with the Beinecke materials, it was a, it was a different orientation. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I, I guess I don't have a ton. I would just echo what has been said yeah. about um, uh, still the importance of, yeah. of knowing the collection well and reaching out to um, communities. Because I think actually, in particular with the Beinecke, I remember going back home and people were surprised about some of the Crow stuff that was there. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe less so about actually what was in the Peabody and, and gallery collections. Yeah, yeah. The, the collections, you know, there's so much to understand but the impact globally, the Beinecke collections and the training that people go through here at Yale, you know, that has expanded across the globe and influenced other museums and collection institutions and uh, methodologies, um, epistemologies. And to really understand what is interconnected between the Beinecke, between the Peabody, because each of, each of our collections have their own archives but records have been separated out. And so there's always finding these stories of the material objects, items are within the Peabody's collection. And there's little handwritten notes on some of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then we find out a little bit more that actually that person's personal collection and archive is at the Beinecke. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing that clearly connects it um, that's consistently present in those object files. So there's a lot of collaboration that could happen and be part of those initiatives. And there's a lot of people that are doing that work. Taryn Andrews is, you know, diving into the archive in those collections. Sandra Sanchez is diving in and really looking at what more we can learn internally. Um, here, that's already at Yale. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question and then that would be it. One moment to you all um, for such a, a generative and um, really genuine um, and generous conversation. I think so often when we speak about indigenous presence in these spaces, it becomes um, like ungenerous and um, and 
very legalistic and about the university's responsibility to return and these sorts of things, which of course are a big part of this conversation, but I'm really struck and energized by the way that all three of you are collectively trying to find a way forward into different modes of relation. And I just wonder if you could um, say a little bit about as much as there are different kind of institutions or different pockets across the Peabody and, and UAG and Beinecke, there's also just different centers of power in terms of students and faculty and people in Dr. Youngwolf's position. And I wonder if you could um, maybe say how we as a collective can come together to find ways to kind of concentrate the power that we do have in these really disparate spaces um, to, to affect these changes that are so important. Do you want to start? And I'll wrap this uh, up. That's a, a very good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, something we were reflecting on prior to this conversation was the fact that when we had curated the exhibit, we were students. And so we didn't have um, uh, maybe the power or authority and resources that somebody in a permanent position might have, um, which made our process different. But I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the ways that we were able to do it at the time was through the support of, you know, certain staff at both institutions who were who believed in the the work of improving representation of indigenous uh, peoples at Yale, um, and so I guess like it's really gonna. T I think, and maybe to Leah's earlier point and what you've said before, like it can't just be a personality. It, it, we have to figure out how to make broader change and I think I would hope that people feel um, inspired to reflect on the ways that they have both supported and perhaps limited um, indigenous led uh, movements for indigenous mm -hmm. representation at these institutions and thinking about what type of position you're in and what you can bring um, to assist if you believe that this is something that should happen, which I hope that you do. Yeah, yeah. I think that... <laughs> do I, be noted. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. And I think when we were students, you know, we, we didn't have power in some ways because we didn't have control over certain resources. And, you know, we also just didn't have age and experience. Um, but we also had power in other ways in that, you know, our livelihoods weren't tied to any of the institutions we were, you know, working at in the same way that someone who's a permanent employee has that, you know, employer-employee relationship. So there were areas where I think we felt very comfortable pushing further than one might at one's own place. Um, and then even when, when we, you know, had been working at these institutions for a few years, I found that our student advisory group started pushing us a lot more politically um, mm -hmm. because maybe we were getting, I don't know, complacent or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, getting too used to the environment of being in the institution, having access to things that these other students didn't have as much access to and they really, really pushed us. We also relied on professors for the different ways that they had knowledge about the collections and knowledge about you know, different bodies of scholarship. And we relied on people who worked in the museums and had knowledge about curation and, and kind of the histories of indigenous curation. And we sought out folks who had those different kinds of knowledge. So I think you're right, Taryn, in that you know, we all kind of were bringing our own knowledge, but also our own areas where we felt very empowered to the project. And I wonder, like, I don't know if there is a, a more formalized way that folks across campus who are working on this could, could get together, because I actually don't know a lot about what you're doing in terms of the Beinecke and, and databases. And um, I wonder, you know, how many others would benefit from, from hearing about that and, and from learning from your experiences. So do we need like a community advisory board? Do we need, uh, that has folks who are, who are permanent and who stay on over the years, but also students who cycle in and out and bring different perspectives and energy? Um, I don't know, it's something, something to think about. Yeah, it, you know, thank you for your question. Again, um, 
there's there's a lot of dynamics that I'm still learning. Um, my position as a postdoc was just over a year and a half, and I felt empowered and with agency in different ways while I was a postdoc, while I was a professor. Um, and while I really hit the ground running, you know, um, I was told by many of the people here that helped bring me in that if you want to see something happen, just push for it, ask for it. You know, there's not, you know, the worst is they're going to say no. Um, and I did, and I was really able to bring in, a, you know, a, a dozen artists and knowledge keepers and have an indigenous speaker series. Moline Theodore was like, let's make this happen. And, um, you know, the department allowed me to create a course. Um, Millette and Mark were like, create this course, make it a dream course, bring in people to share that experience. And so I was able to have my course evoking ancestral memory feature so many knowledge keepers and artists, um, as well as be a maker session and experimental learning. Um, and we got to work with the collections. When I became a permanent employee, again, those dynamics shifted. And I have a dual position. At the UAG, I'm a curator. I'm the assistant curator of the Native American Collection of Art. At the Peabody, I'm a collection manager, but I'm also working as a curator of the exhibit. But I don't hold the same agency at each of the institutions. And I work in different ways at each of those institutions. So even within my position, there's dynamics that I'm still learning to understand. And finding continuity of what can we expect as a baseline as a standard for representation and stewardship and culturally responsive care across the collections here at Yale that helps stabilize these experiences a bit because not all of them are wonderful and beautiful and not all of them you know, are challenging for a good purpose. Um, some are really just to challenge you and to see if you'll stick it out here. So I look at sustainability what happens when I get tired? What happens when the people who are coming in to engage with the collections experience something that we weren't prepped for or we didn't prep them for? These are all part of that work. And so understanding what's in the archives, understanding what's in each of the institution's collections and how can we better have a group who are invested already here at Yale. We're not bringing them in from across the, the world to tell us where our heart should be, but we are actually utilizing the hearts that are here to help guide and develop these standards. I think it would be beneficial to have a consistent present of groups of people who are already here and can speak to this place and can speak to the regional tribal groups um, about how do we best take care of these materials in this space. And then those who know how to work here, you know, that knowledge and value of the longtime um, staff members is so important. And they've really supported me in this position here. But having consistency, where we stop hearing the voice and we stop like having that clear guide is when we have people who are just helicoptered in. They come in to advise on a little question here or a little question there, and there's not a consistent voice or presence. So this space is one of transition. Mm -hmm. It's one that we are still trying to understand and create a way that we can have, you know, a comprehensive um, transparency about what's here, but also what's possible I really love bringing in people and having these type of conversations because I forget actually that there are so many possibilities. And having those other artists and other curators and the benefit of that broad conversation is we can find out what another institution is doing that is really beneficial or what they, they really spent years at doing and it wasn't beneficial. So we have to make sure that we're bringing in those advisors 
um, so it doesn't become a situation where it's it's just my perspective because I'm not all tribes. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm Ittishuga, I'm Haradza. I have um, mentors who are very focused on just our tribal traditions, and I'm a mother as well. So I don't think about myself as just a student. I think about my kinship, and I think about the longevity of my actions. Um, and that also means I'm slow in responding sometimes, especially to emails. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm Eastern Shoshone, and I think that's one of the main things we need to ask about those advisors or anyone we bring in is their positionality. Mm. Where is that heart actually coming from? What is the lens? And all of the works here by indigenous artists, those one day will be ancestral works. So the questions we have about those old collections now, we can't make the mistakes again by not asking the artists and really curating relationships with living artists to have that story present. So Mazirat, thank you all. Wonderful to have you here. Really quick before <laughs> you wrap up, I'm sorry, I know we're over. We just wanted to um, thank you no, and congratulate you on the, the completion of your postdoc no. and also say thank oh. you. In this moment of transition, we want to take a second to just reflect on everything that you've I've been so good. I haven't made eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> and changed I don't so want to cry. So thank you, Roy. Oh, Mazirat, thank you. I was going <laughs> to... I was going to gift you both. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, again, please enjoy your night. Please continue to value and love indigenous artworks. Um, thank you all. I look forward to when you get and experience the Marie Watts again. They're absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, so have a good night. Good evening. Oxiatsugits. <laughs>